Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come to this uh, conference. And I apologize that I can't deliver my talk in French. Uh, despite my French heritage, my French is just too bad. It would be a, pain, a painful experience for you. So in the short time I have, I want to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing, trying to understand really, as Christopher said, how people with autism see and understand the world. Um, that understanding of the autistic perspective being a starting point for, we think, intervention, but also for research into what brain areas and eventually what genetic and other causes might be important. So I'll begin by telling you a little bit about what I mean by central coherence and then talk about how that fits as part of the puzzle of autism, along with problems of empathy or theory of mind and executive function. I'll talk about uh, why we think this aspect of autism isn't a deficit, but instead a difference, a different way of looking at the world. And I'll mention some of our studies showing that this way of looking at this, uh, the world can be found in people who don't have autism, including the parents of some children with autism. And in relation to that, I'll talk about the link between autism and talent. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some of our more recent work looking at whether being good at spotting details necessarily means you're bad at seeing the big picture uh, and mention some future directions. So what is central coherence? This is a term that was coined by Uta Frith uh, and it referred to the ability to pull information together for higher level meaning. So um, Uta said that uh, the drive for coherence pulls together large amounts of information like the tributaries of a river and without that type of high level cohesion, pieces of information would remain just pieces, whether they're big pieces or small pieces. This very much fits with what Leo Kanner described in his first accounts of autism, the inability to experience wholes without full attention to the constituent parts. And Kanner goes on to say that's why the child or adult with autism is so dist distressed by even tiny changes. This idea that people with autism see the world in terms of details so their central coherence isn't a strong drive for meaning. Instead, we talk about weak central coherence or detailed focus in autism. And so in autism, the attention is on the small details. In neurotypical, non-autistic people, the attention is primarily for the big picture and for meaning and context. An example would be that hopefully at the end of my talk, you carry away some general message, some gist of what I'm saying. But it would be surprising if any of you could repeat exactly the words I used. But of course, many people with autism show exactly the opposite pattern. They may miss the general big picture meaning, but remember the exact words used. This idea has become somewhat popular, uh, at least in uh, Britain, <laughs> among individuals and their families individuals with aut autism and their families. And you can see here a poster that the National Autistic Society, the Parents Association in Britain, uh, was using a few years ago. Um, I know you can't read it, the, the um, text begins as follows. When a person with autism walks into a room, the first thing they see is a pillow with a coffee stain shaped like Africa, a train ticket sticking out of a magazine, 25 floorboards, a remote control, a paper clip on the mantelpiece, a marble under the chair, a crack in the ceiling, 12 grapes in a bowl, and it goes on and on and on. And then at the bottom it says, so it's not surprising that they ignore you completely. This ability to focus on details, to see details perhaps that the rest of us miss, is easily tapped in simple tasks like the block design test, where the child or adult has to copy the design using the different um, patterned blocks. For most of us, this is somewhat difficult because the whole design, as you see it, is seen as a whole. But to copy it, we have to break it down into its parts. And you can make it an easier task for neurotypicals like you and I by segmenting the blocks, as you see on the far side. For people with autism, block design tasks are typically very easy. And they do, don't find it very much easier if you segment the design. They already see the pattern in terms of its parts. 
I want to say something about where this notion of cognitive style, of detail focus in autism, fits into a more general understanding of autism at the psychological or cognitive level. In recent years, the group that I work with have been asking the question, is autism one thing or many? As several speakers, including Christopher, have... Oh, gosh. <laughs> this is interesting. Um, as Christopher and others mentioned, we now often talk about autisms because we know that there isn't going to be a single cause for autism and that one individual will likely have a different collection of genetic problems for, and a different cause for their autism from another individual. So autism is very heterogeneous, many different individuals under the umbrella of autism spectrum disorder. I'm asking a different question when I say, is autism one thing? I want to ask the question, do the different um, features that define autism, social impairment, communication impairment, rigid and repetitive behavior, do those three areas of difficulty have a single cause? So for one individual, do those three areas come about from a common cause? Is autism a monolith, a single thing, or is it a composite, a collection of different difficulties that come together in one child? And our studies, including twin studies that I won't go into today, um, and family studies, suggests that there are largely independent genetic effects, at least on the social and communication difficulties and on the rigid and repetitive behaviours. And at a common sense level, we can see this from family studies where parents of a child with autism will often say, oh yes, aunt so-and-so is socially very unusual, has always been a recluse. Um, and uncle so-and-so has a fantastic eye for detail he was an engineer or he was a proofreader. But these different aspects of autism are coming together in the single child. Why am I bothering to tell you this today? Because I think it also means that we don't have to look for a single explanation in terms of a psychological theory that will help us understand why people with autism lack theory of mind, as Christopher has talked about, and also why they tend to focus on details. I think these are different aspects that come together in that individual but have different explanations. At the cognitive level, at the biological and neural level, and at the genetic level. So I'm going to concentrate my talk today on weak central coherence and detail focus. But I believe that understanding the social impairments and communication impairments in autism uh, crucially involves understanding the way that people with autism fail to read other people's minds or have empathy in Christopher's terms. And I also think an important part of autism is understanding problems of executive functions, problems of planning, inhibiting, controlling action. One thing to mention before I go on is that this way of looking at autism as a composite that comes about when many different difficulties or cognitive styles come together, fits very well with the essence notion that comorbidity, if you want to call it that, is the rule. Complication will be the rule. Heterogeneity will be the rule because it's what collection of different difficulties you have that makes you the person you are. I'm not denying that there isn't something incredibly special about autism, but I think it comes about through the interaction of a number of different uh, difficulties or patterns of cognitive function. Some of those may be shared with ADHD or with other difficulties. That's not a problem. We no longer have to expect that every part of autism will be unique to autism. And that's good news because it means that we can learn for autism from groups that work with head injuries, with all kinds of other different clinical groups because they may have important things in common with autism even though autism is special. So um, our work leads us to think that the eye for detail in autism is independent from the difficulty in reading other people's minds. So uh, I won't go into too much detail because of time, um, but uh, if you look at how people with autism perform on standard IQ tests, 
they typically do badly at tasks that require you to put yourself in another person's shoes. Um, in the one standard task, you'll ask questions like, um, uh, why do we have policemen? Now, this test is meant to uh, engage you in thinking about you know, what, what pragmatically is the right kind of answer to this question. So it's a social task, in fact. And whereas a typically developing child may say, we need policemen to keep law and order so that bad people don't get their way, a child with autism may say, we need policemen to wear helmets or answer a question like, um, what should you do if you cut your finger? And the experimenter wants you to think about something like, oh, get a sticking plaster. But a child with autism who's not reading the experimenter's mind may say, uh, what should you do if you cut your finger? You should bleed, because that's what happens. A logical but not a social answer. And this pattern of difficulty is seen regardless of how good you are at spotting details. So individuals who are fantastic at that block design task still have difficulty in this kind of reading other minds. And similarly, individuals who are very detail focused in their drawing, and I know you can't really see that, um, uh, uh, may or may not also have difficulties in planning this executive function. So executive function, theory of mind, weak coherence seem to be somewhat independent in autism and in the general population. So we think of central coherence as a cognitive style so that everybody in this room would be somewhere along that spectrum from the individual who has a good grasp of gist but loses the detail. So if you go to the cinema and you come out and you can tell the whole story of what you saw but you can't remember any of the names or details to the person who is very good at details but maybe misses the big picture. So the person who is a fantastic proofreader can always remember pin numbers and things that don't necessarily have meaning. And we think of this not as a deficit, but as a bias. So just as you were able probably for your exams at school to sometimes memorize things that didn't have any meaning for you, but you didn't enjoy doing it, so people with autism although they naturally go to details, can look to the big picture and process for meaning, but they don't necessarily enjoy it, and they don't do it automatically. An illustration that this eye for detail is not a deficit in itself is seen in the fact that the parents, and particularly the fathers of boys with autism, quite often show this eye for detail. <coughs> And if you just have that eye for detail without the social difficulties, then it's not a disadvantage at all. In fact, it suits you very well to some jobs in science, uh, in computing, where an eye for detail is critical. And we found that around half of the fathers and around a third of the mothers in our study shared an eye for detail with their children with autism. And this may explain in part the puzzle of autistic talent. We know that somewhere between 10% and 30% of individuals on the autism spectrum are unusually good at something, either compared to their other pattern of abilities or sometimes compared to ordinary people. So here you can see Stephen Wiltshire drawing from memory after a 20 minute helicopter ride, um, the view of the city of Tokyo extraordinary abilities that we see in autism that we think are part of this attention to detail. The same attention to detail that makes a child with autism repetitive and restricted in their behavior be very distressed if the lined up toys get changed. The same eye for detail can also lead to talent. So I don't need to go into the details, but in a general population twin sample, we found that Parents who told us their children, ordinary children, were unusually good at maths or music or art or memory, were also very likely to tell us that their children were, had some traits of autism, and particular, particularly had traits of rigid and repetitive behavior, and particularly had traits of noticing and remembering details that other people miss. And in this twin study, we're able to look at the genetic contribution to these individual differences. 
and the results suggested to us a large overlap between the genetic contribution to autistic traits and eye for detail and the genetic contribution to talent. So part of the story, when we understand the genes influencing <laughs> autism, part of the story may also tell us a lot about the genes that influence talent, at least in some areas. So I've talked about eye for detail, and I've talked about difficulty seeing the big picture. And uh, traditionally, these two things have rather been put together. And if you read the psychology literature by Simon Baron Cohen or Laurent Montrand, you'll see that there um, is often a feeling that if you're good at local processing, uh, maybe you have to be bad at global processing, maybe they're in balance, or maybe people with autism are just good at local processing and there's no difficulty in putting information together. So some of our recent work has been trying to revisit that question. Here's another task that you'll be good at if you have a good eye for detail, or maybe if you're not distracted by the big picture. So in the embedded figures test, you have to spot the part within the whole. You could be good at that because you are good at focusing in on details, or you could be good at this because you're not distracted by the gestalt, which has a sort of camouflaging effect here. So we've made up some tasks that we think pull apart those two things. And in particular, we've come up with some tasks where we think it really is measuring how good you are putting information together. So we want to find out, do some people with autism not only have a good eye for detail, but have difficulty putting information together? So this is a fragmented figures task that my colleague Rhonda Booth created based on the um, famous uh, Snodgrass pictures. And what the child or adult sees it on the screen are some fragments building up slowly, adding more and more fragments, and their task is to stop the computer as soon as they can guess what the picture is. And importantly, we make sure that no fragment, no little piece on its own will tell you what the picture is. So if it was a picture of an elephant at the end, we would make sure there wasn't a tusk that came in so that you could just see the tusk and guess the whole picture. You can't do it by being good at details. You have to put together all the little pieces. And what we find is that people with autism need more of the pieces. They need to see more of the picture before they can tell you what it is. So this is a task, although it's visuospatial, which often works to strengths in autism, this is a task that people with autism find difficult. Here's another example of a task where you have to put information together. This is an impossible figure. It might remind you of the MC Escher pictures, because if you trace round, you can see that it doesn't quite make sense. You couldn't make this in three dimensions out of wood. Uh, the joins are all wrong. And interestingly, the impossibility only becomes clear when you look at it globally. If you focus on any small area, all of those are okay. They all make sense. It's only when you trace all around it that you see it doesn't, it couldn't connect up. So we think judging if these figures are possible or impossible requires global processing. And again, we found that people with autism found it more difficult. They were less successful here in making that discrimination possible or impossible compared to age and IQ matched control individuals. And I'm nearly finished. I want to make the point that some people with autism have a strong superiority of local processing. Some individuals are poor at global processing. Some have both aspects. And we're just beginning to see this as another area where there's heterogeneity. And it may be important to know what the child's perceptual and learning style is in order to tailor education correctly for that child. But this simple task illustrates that these two things can be separated out in a simple way. We asked children with autism and other children with other conditions, draw a house like mine, and we showed them a very simple picture. And you can see that this picture at the top, drawn by a young man with autism, was unusual in that he began with the windows. 
So he started with a detail, and it was only at the very end that he put the outside frame on. That's very unusual for a typically developing child, and that to us would suggest he is a detail-focused child. But look at the end product. It's very coherent. It's nicely planned and organized. No apparent problem in global processing. And then look at the picture at the bottom, again by a young man with autism. Here we asked him, draw a house with four windows. And you can see he's done exactly that. He's drawn the house at the bottom, then one, two, three, four windows. He's drawn the roof, and he's even drawn the chimney. There's no problem in, no superiority of local processing, but there's a problem of global processing. He hasn't put it all together in the right way. So even a very simple task can begin to suggest how different one child with autism may be from another in a way that could be useful in pointing the way to educational intervention. So our future directions are to explore more whether there's necessarily a trade-off between local and global. Um, whether an early attention to detail may be developmentally leads to some individuals not practicing and getting good at global processing, in which case we could intervene. <clears throat> Understanding more about individual differences within the autism spectrum. Re-examining the relationship with other aspects of autism. Maybe being bad at putting information together does have an effect on your social skills and your theory of mind, but maybe having a good eye for detail doesn't, and the picture may be more complex. But most importantly, our belief that these aspects are independent means that we could develop interventions to improve global processing without taking away that good eye for detail that is a real asset for many individuals with autism. And we're working on interventions to teach children with autism to zoom out, using the analogy of a video camera zooming out, to understand that some tasks are big picture tasks. And some tasks are ones where the natural tendency to look at details is the most useful approach. Um, and in the same way, we've developed interventions for theory of mind that take the analogy of thinking about the mind as like a camera, as like a machine. So using intact understanding to scaffold uh, areas of difficulty. So I'll finish there and uh, thank the people who worked with me, especially the participants with autism, and uh, looking forward very much to any questions you want to ask me.